Hello, everyone, and welcome to America Walks webinar, Youth Leading the Way, Inspiring Stories of Youth Creating Safe, Accessible Neighborhoods. My name is Nicole Smith. I am the Operations and Program Manager for America Walks, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Kelsey Card, who is Communications and Development Manager, and she's running tech this afternoon. Before we get started, we'd like to thank our sponsors and give you a quick how-to for sending questions and comments during the presentation. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see a chat box where you can enter your questions and comments. Um, we will try to answer as many as we can at the end of the webinar. Also, if you would prefer to use closed captioning, the link is also available in the chat box for you. So today's webinar focuses on inspiring stories from youth leaders who are working to create safe, accessible neighborhoods. Youth are the future of our communities, and we will hear from four students who are working to create meaningful, inclusive, and lasting change in their communities through innovative programming with the YMCA. First, we'll hear from David Fu and Jack Kelly, who took part in the YMCA's 2020 Changemakers Institute, which is a virtual summer program available to all high school students. Um, just to share a little bit about David. David Fu is a sophomore currently living in Short Hills, New Jersey. He lived in Shanghai, China for most of his life before coming to America two years ago. David's youth initiative is to help improve pedestrian safety within his community. Currently, David is helping his community to apply for a grant from Safe Routes to School to build sidewalks and crosswalks for schools in his community. And he'll tell you a little bit more about himself uh, when we get into his presentation. Jack Kelly is a senior at Shenandoah High School in Clifton Park, New York. Jack is very involved in his school and community, serving as the president of his student senate and debate team, working on the leadership team for his local youth and government district, and the state director of operations for Homoglobin, an advocacy group advocating for LGBTQ plus healthcare and education policies, as well as blood equivalency. Jack's youth, youth initiative will establish a walkability community in his committee in his community, and we'll hear more about him during his presentation. Um, so then we will hear from Banaja Richardson and Jessica Crockett Murphy, who participated in the YMCA's Youth and Government Program and developed active and healthy communities projects as part of a Centers for Disease Control and Prevention YMCA grant. And to just share a little bit about them, Banaja lives in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. She's a college freshman at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, where she's majoring in political science with a minor in legal studies and is a member of Charlotte's pre-law society. Banaja is a graduate of Parkland High School and a former, former international baccalaureate diploma student. Last year, she participated in the YMCA Walkability Audit Grant to assess walkable areas in school zones, which then resulted in her delegation reaching out to their local council members. She's passionate about advocating for and elevating both small and large scale walkability solutions for her local area and beyond. And Jessica graduated from Marshfield, Marshfield High School this past year, is now a freshman studying political science at Stonehill College. She's extremely involved in college already taking part in first generation and LGBT dialogue groups, as well as recently being elected class president. Through youth and government, she drafted a mock policy targeted towards the active communities program, which sought to open all public schools in Massachusetts to be even more um, of a community asset by allowing towns to use the facilities during non-school hours. And then we have two other special guests. Um, we're also joined by Derek Somerville, National Youth Engagement Director, and Stephanie Tepperberg, Health Partnerships and Policy Specialist with YMCA of the USA's Government Relations and Policy Department, who will give us an overview of the YMCA programs we will discuss today. So we are gonna start out with um, Derek today with a brief overview of the Youth and Government Program and 2020 Changemakers Institute. So Derek, take it away. Thank you so much uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Derek Somerville and I am the National Youth Engagement Director for the YMCA Youth and Government Program. 
Um, we're actually a coalition. We are 43 uh, state programs all around the country, each having their own governance structure and leadership, much like your state governments do. Um, but we work within the YMCA movement um, as a program of the Y since 1936. Um, we were we were founded um, because the Y wanted to do a, have a better job of not just providing students with uh, programs that kept them safe and engaged, but also gave them a voice in their community uh, that helped them create change. Um, so we've been doing that for a long time now, um, but we have 43 programs around the country that do this. Um, the students that you're gonna hear from today are from four of them. Um, we have 55,000 students nationwide that take part in youth and government. Um, those are from middle school, high school, and even into college. Um, these students focus mostly on state government, but they work on model government programs at the local, state, federal, and even international level. Um, they at our during our state pro, our state government programs, which are kind of our focus, our premier um, segment of the uh, of the uh, experience. Uh, t about 10,000 student bills are written every single year. These are bills written by the students, researched, debated, uh, and oftentimes advocated for after our conferences. So you might hear some of our students talk about a bill they wrote. Those were uh, bills written uh, and debated uh, amongst their peers. Uh, I, um, when we go back and look over the course of, of, of any state's legislative history, a lot of the ideas our students were debating were about three to five years ahead of their official counterparts. Um, in addition to those uh, state government um, programs, we also have about 245 conferences and events we run throughout the year. These work on uh, youth advocacy, service learning, civic engagement, leadership development. Um, we do a lot of work around um, get, out, get out the vote and youth voting, um, which we're very excited about this coming um, in about 34 days. Uh, but youth in government is, um, has been a key part of the WISE uh, youth development uh, area of focus for a long time now. Um, but what we when when the whole world kind of hit pause uh, as we all addressed COVID-19 in the spring, um, using government much like any other program that brings together a lot of students in one place from all over the state, quickly realized that we were going to have to pivot. Um, that that our model of how we empowered young people and how we gave them a voice was not going to be sustainable uh, in a space where we had to keep people socially distant, keep them safe, and make sure that we weren't putting in anyone's safety at risk. So what we came up with um, was our Change Makers Institute. Um, and the Change Makers Institute, uh, if you want to go to the next slide, um, was a, a basically our response to how we wanted to engage young people during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it was a virtual platform for high school students to make an impact in their local communities. Um, we had a 10-week curriculum that ran from about early, early June all the way through the end of August, uh, and it asked students to focus on one of our areas of impact, we have three, youth development, healthy living, and social responsibility, uh, and combine that with an interest or a passion an, an, or, or an issue uh, within one of the UN's 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. Um, and what each student did was find a way uh, to merge those two where whatever that intersection was for some people for some people that was the intersection of social justice and um school safety it was you know saying we want to reform how we have police presence in our schools for others it was ensuring that their community was um socially responsible but also had clean water uh that that are that their economic activity didn't uh contribute to poor community health for others like the ones you talked about you're gonna hear from today it was about making their communities safer about, about making those, their communities more walkable, about making them um, uh, more accessible for not just young people, but for all members of their community in ways that um, maybe we weren't thinking about pre-COVID. Uh, um, we were lucky to have four and two students join us from 38 different states as part of the Institute. Um, that resulted in 185 what we called initiative presentations and eventual certifications. Um, these were students who, as you can kind of see in the background of the slide, uh, joined a Zoom call, much like we all have for the past six months, um, to present their ideas to YMCA leaders from all over the country. You know, we, we had students like Jack or David who would get on a, a, a panel and be talking to YMCA leaders in South Dakota and the Cheyenne River Reservation in Honolulu, Hawaii, um, as well as in upstate New York. So we wanted to make sure that while this was a locally focused program, that we helped expose them to a variety of leaders and communities all across the country who, were, who themselves were responding to a lot of the same problems that the students were working with in our communities. Um, so uh, 
Today, we are very excited for you to hear from these four students um, who all did youth in government, two of whom we did the Changemakers Institute. Um, and what I wanna um, stress is that anyone who is looking to engage with young people on these issues, um, the most common thing that we can, that we find whenever we start these programs is it, our job um, as community leaders, as adults, as grownups, whatever you wanna call us, is to continually remind them that this is something they can do, that they have the skills, that they have the, that we can give them the confidence to do that, that this is not something that is beyond them, um, that any small piece of change that they can take a part of is meaningful, uh, and that it's gonna take time. So uh, we're, we're very proud of all the work they've done uh, over the last, um, Few months in some cases or a year uh, in other cases um, and I am excited uh, to introduce our first um, youth, youth leader and that is uh, David Fu. Hello my name is David Fu. I am a sophomore in Milburn High School, and I currently live in Short Hills, New Jersey. This summer, I participated in the YMCA Youth and Government Changemakers Institute. I found out about the institute from my parents, who proposed to let me join since my summer camp was canceled due to COVID. As part of the institute, we were charged with developing an initi initiative to foster meaningful change in my community. My initiative is to help create a safer environment for people who walk in my community. I want to do this because when I was living in China, there were many sidewalks around the area that I live in, allowing me to freely and safely walk in my community in China. This made me happy since I could reach various locations by foot, such as the nearby convenience store. Thus, I would like to also experience this in my community here. My initial goal was to try to get sidewalks on some of the main streets connecting my community because these are the streets with the most cars and they can allow people in the suburbs like me to access downtown more safely by foot. So I decided to start a survey asking about the prospect of building sidewalks on some of the main streets in my community. And I shared it through social media and to friends asking whether they would support it or not. In total, 50 people completed the survey. Simultaneously, I did research and found out about the Safe Routes to School Initiative and the Pedestrian Safety Advisory Board. The SRTS initiative aims to encourage students to travel to school by foot or by bicycles. It also gives grants to towns for sidewalk projects. The Pedestrian Safety Advisory Board, an organization in my community, aims to make the town safer for walking and biking. After several emails, I managed to get in contact with the chair of the board, Jennifer Duckworth. I talked to her about my initiative and asked her for feedback. To summarize, she believes that my initiative to build sidewalks on the main streets in our community is challenging for a few reasons. One, because revamping the main streets so that they can fit sidewalks is time consuming and expensive. And two, because I learned that these streets are owned by the county and sidewalk maintenance also requires a lot of money and manpower. Not wanting to give up on this project though, Jennifer proposed to let me work with people wanting to build sidewalks near an elementary school. As a result, I decided to change the goals of my project to focus more on helping to build sidewalks near my local schools so that children can safely walk to school. Even though our YMCA Changemakers Institute is technically over, I've continued my project and am currently working with Mara Epstein, head of a sidewalk project to get an SRTS grant to help fund sidewalks near one of my community's elementary schools. So far, a Google map mapping a planned route for the sidewalk, as well as a survey asking about how people near the school feel about walking to the school have been created. 111 people have completed the survey and I analyzed the results and discovered that many people are concerned with the lack of sidewalks and speeding cars so close to the school. As our next step, I am waiting to hear back from the project leader, who will be having an upcoming meeting with the town committee, committee to ask about how they feel about this project. Additionally, due to COVID, our plans for physically walking around the streets near the school in Paris to map out potential sidewalks cannot be done, and we're exploring other possible options to raise awareness about the need for sidewalks around the school. 
I look forward to working on this project in the coming months and years. To conclude, I have learned that you should do your research first. That means you should find out if your community is currently working on the change that you want to see. And in my case, I found out that my community is working on trying to get a grant to install sidewalks. And remember, take action based on what the community needs, not what you think they need. Thank you. All righty, hello everyone. My name is Jack Kelly and I am from Clifton Park, New York. Um, for those of you who have art from upstate New York, um, to give you a little bit of context, that is about 20 minutes south of Saratoga Springs and about 20 minutes north of Albany, right kind of in the center of that capital district. So to briefly discuss a little bit about me and my history with student advocacy, um, I have been a member of a multiple like student advocacy groups, um, a lot of those being through the YMCA. Um, for example, I was part of the YMCA Youth and Government Program since my sophomore year, as well as the YMCA's National Advocacy Days, Change Making Institute, and Safe Routes to Schools programs. What these have done is kind of given me an assortment of, of experience, not only in uh, governmental participation through things like youth and government, but also through direct advocacy with my state legislature and my state lawmakers, like through National Advocacy Days, um, and even things like Safe Routes to Schools and Change Makers, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more in the next coming slides. Um, as a little bit more context also for my work outside of the YMCA alone, I also am the president of my student senate, um, like mentioned before, and this has been where I've gotten a lot of my prior experience doing advocacy. Um, we have worked on multiple proposals in my years with the, our senate, including some work to make our trays and uh, utensils in our cafeteria sustainable um, development ones instead of using the um, disposable plastic. We've also done work on um, improving our diversity council in order to make sure that students are fully represented at the district level. And in addition, we've done work to um, look at the ability of class rank and how it affects our students. Uh, in addition, I've also worked with some groups such as what Nicole mentioned on um, being homoglobin, um, a group working to not only uh, promote youth uh, engagement in voting, but also LGBTQ uh, issues and rights such as blood equivalency. Uh, so in regards to Safe Routes to Schools, I began with the inaugural class of the Alliance of New York State YMCA's Safe Routes to Schools Student Ambassador Program in 2019. Uh, at the SRTS Student Ambassador Program was established from the Alliance of New York State YMCA's as part of the CDC YMCA Active Communities Grant. The goal of this was to build awareness about Safe Routes to Schools and the programs that it offered in a bunch of diverse communities throughout um, the state of New York. Ultimately, the goal was to increase support for the program at both local and state levels. Um, to start, we first met over Zoom and we learned about the importance of walkability and how to perform walk audits. We then performed them and we specifically reported these findings to our local government officials. Um, in my case, I talked to my town, um, including uh, Jen Vigiani, and she's our open space coordinator at my town. And what she did for me is she kind of walked out what my town currently does. My town happens to be a town that is very suitable for walkability. And so they have actually been in the process um, right now of initiating a five-year plan to connect all, almost all parts of our town via sidewalks. So she kind of shared with me what my town was doing based on that advocacy that I had just given to her. These are some pictures from that first walk audit. What I did this, what I did that summer was focus on the area right around my school. So um, you can see over on the left, there's that sidewalk that leads right into my school campus. And then on the right, there's kind of the sidewalk on the other side of the street um, and kind of the lack there of um, effective transportation. We kind of analyzed how it was um, effective for students to get to school um, when they had to cross such a busy street to get into campus because that is a 45 mile an hour highway um, that they're kind of working on. And that was the analysis that we were working on that year. Now, this year, I once again participated in the SRTS um, Student Ambassador Program. However, due to COVID-19, um, one of our challenges was how do we perform a walk audit when we're not able to really walk outside with other people? Um, our goal had been to bring up leaders on these walk audits this year. Now that we had kind of had the experience of doing a walk audit first ourselves, we thought that it would be very effective to take them out and show them. However, of course, there were complications with that. And so we decided to come up with virtual ways to demonstrate our knowledge of walk audits. To do this, we worked with um, Mark Fenton, a leading expert in walkability, to come up with virtual models. Um, what we, what a majority of the students, including myself, decided 
was to use a Google form with short videos and kind of a ranking sheet. And we released this to town leaders, school leaders, and community members. The feedback was great, especially for the first year. We got, a, I'd say, at least a 60 to 75% response rate from the emails we sent out to. And in coming years, we think this would be much higher, especially if we were not in a, such a virtual setting. These are some pictures from the walk audit we did this spring. Uh, you can see um, both of these pictures were taken relatively in the same area. They are both um, from the business district right in our town. And we felt that kind of focusing on this area, since we had already focused on the schools prior, would be a useful way to um, analyze how the town's infrastructure was working and where we could still see improvements as we're working through this um, five-year grant. Um, following almost immediately after the Safe Routes to Schools Ambassador Program this year, which ended in around June, I began the YMCA Changemakers Institute. As Derek described before, um, this was a 10-week summer program. What I did is I was you know, so inspired from my work with Safe Routes to Schools, after having now done it for two years, that I thought this was the perfect time to take my advocacy a little bit further. Of course, there was nothing I could really do at my town to advocate for more sidewalks or anything um, like David's working on because my town had kind of already agreed to that. So there wasn't a lot for me to fight for there, and I just had to kind of wait it out. However, I wanted to still make the most use of my time while I'm still living in my community before I go off to college. And so I decided to work with Jen Vigiani again to create a community project of a walkability committee for my town. Uh, this project, which I'll explain a little bit more later, was something that I then shared with um, both peers who were working on similar projects at the time, as well as mentors from across the um, United States who had a little bit of experience in walkability, who were from the Y, and who could give me some more feedback on how they had seen things in, on their end and how they'd seen other projects develop. So the resulting action of this was the creation of the Clifton Park Walkability Committee. Essentially what this does is our goal is to uh, develop and improve the culture of walkability and bikeability in the town of Clifton Park. We modeled this off of some similar committees that we have in neighboring towns such as Bethlehem, New York. And while we are still in the process of you know, kind of finalizing it and doing the bureaucratic things that are required to make sure a committee is um, completely substantial uh, in a town community. Uh, we are working both with um, community members, town officials, as well as some local student groups who have been interested in walkability to kind of connect everyone as we begin our first steps. And so that's going to be hopefully rolling out in the next few months. Um, and then our first projects will probably take place um, in late winter and early spring. So the lessons learned from all this work, and I and I don't want to treat it as though this is, you know, the, the final end of my advocacy, because of course this will still continue, but the lessons I have at this point learned really are kind of come in two prongs, one to my peers and two to my organizations and the, the people kind of above me that I'm working with. Uh, first, for my peers, it is important to reach out to your local leaders. Oftentimes it seems as though these people are kind of like deified there above us in a way where like we are too scared to reach out to them because we're so young. However, that's just what they want. They want to work with us, and so it's important to do that. However, when you are reaching out to a leader, um, a local leader in your community, you do want to make sure that you're respecting their time. And as such, it's essential to be organized and communicate effectively. However, for organizations, in order to make sure that students and young people feel comfortable reaching out to you in order to kind of um, subvert that stereotype that um, the leaders in our community don't care about young people, it's really important to listen when young people reach out and be you know, enthusiastically engaged, but also to create young spaces for young voices. Sometimes young people have a lot to say, but don't know exactly how to say it because they've never done this sort of thing before. So creating spaces for young voices, the same way you know, Safer to Schools and change makers have been created for me is essential in making sure that young people feel empowered enough to then start going out like I did and doing these things on their own. Thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it over to our next presenter. Great. Hey, Stephanie, we'd love to hear more from you. Yeah, thank you so much, Nicole. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie Tepperberg, and I am a health partnerships and policy specialist with YMCA of the USA. I'm excited to be joining you today to introduce our next two presenters and to provide a bit of background for their presentations. So in that vein, the next two presenters will be discussing their active communities work that they've completed with the YMCA's Youth and Government Program as well as a part of the YMCA Active Communities Grant. So I know you've already heard um, a bit about the Youth and Government Program from Derek, David, and Jack, and you will again um, from both our next two presenters. 
but I wanted to share a bit more about YMCA's active communities work. For the past seven years, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity and Obesity has funded the YMCA originally in all 50 states and most recently in a deep dive in 11 states to do on the ground programming and infrastructure change as well as state and local policy change around active transportation, complete streets and safe routes to school, all with the goal to strengthen and build active and healthy communities. This work is all in support of Active People Healthy Nation CDC's national initiative to get 27 million Americans more physically active by 2027, and also couldn't be done without our incredible partners in the Active People Healthy Nation Partner Network, um, and specifically Safe Routes Partnership for their extensive guidance and expertise, as well as tools for measuring systems change through their Safe Routes to School state report cards. And just a little bit on those report cards, these are um, available for all 50 states on their website. Um, and measure policy supports for active transportation funding, safe routes to school, and complete streets policies. They're released every two years, and most recently were released a couple of months ago for 2020. Um, so I um, sent the link to Nicole, and she'll provide it after the presentations, but would highly encourage folks on the phone to check those out if you haven't done so already. Um, and then I would be remiss not to mention that a number of our other partners with the Active People Healthy Nation Partner Network also have benchmarking reports that are very helpful in um, creating local and state policy change. So check those out as well. Um, so what's really exciting about this Active Communities Grant and the work that we've been doing is that for the past several years, our state alliances of YMCAs that we work with on this work have innovated and have created ways to empower and elevate youth voices around the importance of walkability, bikeability, and the need for safe and inclusive access to community resources to promote public health. The wise purpose is to strengthen communities and, is com and we're committed to doing this by developing new generations of change makers who are creating communities we all want to live in. The students working on the Changemakers Institute that you just heard about and the Active Communities Projects exemplify these incredible changemakers, and we hope that their stories provide inspiration and ideas for folks on the phone who may want to do similar work. So without further ado, I'm um, honored to introduce Benaja Richardson, and after that, Jessica Crockett-Murphy, our next two presenters. So I will go ahead and pass it over to you, Benaja. Thank you, Stephanie. Hi everyone, my name is Banaja Richardson and I'm currently a freshman at UNC Charlotte majoring in political science. And today I'm very excited to talk about the Walk Audit Grant that I participated in last year as, as a senior at Parkland High School. So I served as student delegation leader for Parkland's Youth and Government Program of the William G. White YMCA of Northwest North Carolina. And during one of our club meetings, when, um, our YMCA liaison and advisor, Rain Thorson, introduced to us the concept of walkability through the CDC-funded project to raise awareness about it throughout our community and state. Now, initial, initially, we didn't know what walkability was, much less heard of it. But after Georgia, learning... Yes? We're not able to see your slides, if you can just make sure you're sharing your screen. Okay, I'm so sorry. Hold on. No problem. Okay, can you see it now? Yes, perfect. Okay. I can go back to the cover and this is the first slide. So after um, the concept of walkability was introduced to us, we collectively agreed that arriving to our school by anything other than a vehicle was potentially dangerous. So um, with, con with concern to our involvement, we took the initial steps of conducting research and training in order to assess the importance of active communities and how to evaluate walkability and bikeability. So um, some issues of walkable areas that I address in general, one important point was health. So lack of walkable areas um, kind of limits individuals' access to health benefits. So they may, may not be able to have outdoor exercise to reduce stress or palliate any underlying conditions that can be monitored or controlled with exercise. And overall, this prevents them from leading a healthy lifestyle. Um, the second point with concern to dangers of unmarked areas, when areas are left unmarked, more individuals are prone to road accidents with emphasis to the youth concerning um, road miscalculations or jaywalking. And then of course, there are environmental issues that are increased 
um, where lack of walkable areas also means a reduction in eco-friendly active transportation options, such as your scooters or bikes, to maneuver around the local community. In addition to this, human connectivity is lessened, which of course should not be too much of a concern because of social distancing. But however, individuals in the set region will experience a decrease in interaction. So this also shows how lack of walkable areas can weaken the community. So my purpose of being involved in the audit um, was to examine and assess walkable areas around Parkland High School in order to configure, commit, and propose both short-term and long-term plans to the Winston-Salem City Council to make the local area a more walkable place. I was also very excited to gain experience in gathering evidence for environmental health and policy change, as well as increasing walkability through public policy and educating our decision makers in order to bolster these arguments and findings in order to implement safer crosswalks, signage, and et cetera. So um, here's a satellite image to give you a, um, a better visual context. So um, this red pin on the map, of course, is Parkland High School and we traveled down our own parking lot alongside the heavily wooded area towards our school. Um, from there, we traveled to the library, crossed over um, Parkland Park, and then we uh, went through the residential area near the school. And then um, lastly, we went along, we walked along Peters Creek Parkway, which is the most dangerous area that I will later ex expand on. And um, with concern of Peters Creek Parkway, students on multiple occasions attempt to cross this four lane area daily, um, which have resulted in accidents. So um, overall, we walked about a mile. So um, these are some awesome photos from our walk audit. Uh, the top left corner is from um, us being in the park and there's one from the side of our school. And then um, at the bottom, this is us in the school's residential area and then alongside the library where you see that heavily wooded trail. So um, I got a lot of outcomes from the walk audit. So some positives were that uh, there was a bike and walking lane along the library as well as good lighting around Peters Creek Parkway and Parklands Park. So students and others who are out late, um, their view won't be obstructed. And then um, negatives consisted of areas that should be walkable, do not cater to the elderly. And this uh, regards to jagged concrete, as well as there being a complete lack of crosswalks when not only, um, not only at the library, but Peters Creek Parkway as well to and from the school, as well as the heavily wooded trail um, that needs to be rezoned, monitor and um, trail so individuals can walk to and from the school library and the connecting neighborhoods. So um, after the walk audit, Parkland NC Youth and Government delegation sent out letters and record concerning our findings. And um, many people reached out to state senators, legislators, and so forth so we could kind of branch out. And um, I had the opportunity to uh, have a phone call with council member James Taylor Jr who was also a student at Parkland High School and has a great track of being involved in our community. So um, Councilman Taylor Jr. discussed sending individuals from our Department of Transportation to scope the area with us, uh, which was impeded upon due to COVID. Also, our delegation was planning to attend a city council meeting in the spring to bring forth our proposals for walkability, all of which was halted as well. But the great thing that came out of this was being able to connect with our local decision makers that was receptive to our youth change. Because like um, Jack previously said, um, these, these uh, leaders and decision makers want to hear from us um, and they love how the youth is active in the community. So um, I got a lot of learning outcomes and growth from this that I still carry with me. So this interactive experience with assessing on the ground issues and developing policy solutions exposed me to such to just a fragment of the hard and taxing work it takes to investigate problems and fight and work for those causes. And this audit also greatly took me from my own little bubble um, by opening my eyes about this cause about our very own school. And um, I say this because for me personally, around my area, it's like a cul-de-sac or what many people may call a dead end. So, you know, it's not uncommon for people to freely ride their bikes or dog walk uh, without the fear of oncoming vehicles, in addition to like one or two parks being accessible by car. 
So this audit definitely instilled in me the community awareness to realize that not everyone has access to walkable areas near them. And these are very real issues that I've had the opportunity to learn about. And um, also the walkability audit most importantly demonstrated how crucial it is for young advocates and individuals drawn towards government to be engaged in the very process of enacting for our very communities. So like, you know, in mock government or even any sort of uh, real decision making, it's not hard for us to quickly research something and then um, just rule on it or draft up a bill and send it in. But this audit showed that the legwork is especially a crucial process um, in committing to change. So it's about the real life investment that this walk audit has taught me. And this has also encouraged and impacted my love for policy implementation and the law. And of course, I um, want to give a thanks to America Walks and a very, very special thanks to Rain Thorson, the Northwest North Carolina YMCA and the Parkland Youth and Government Delegation for this moment. Thank you, Banaja. Hello, everyone. My name is Jessica Crockett Murphy, and I am currently a freshman at Stonehill College studying political science. And I'm super excited to share with you all today my experience with the Active Communities Program. So I got involved with this program through my high school's youth and government club where eight students, including myself, were tasked with individually writing a piece of mock policy regarding creating active communities. We all wrote out our own policies, but the central focus was about the lack of public recreational facilities and solving that by opening public schools in Massachusetts for community use after classes. Our end goal was to build off the work that we had done and possibly choose one of the policies or combine them into one to actually be proposed to state legislators this way we could take the project to the next level and spread the awareness and idea of active communities throughout the entire state in a more impactful way. Once everyone had agreed to create their own policy, we began to research and write our drafts. On this slide is actually my finalized product. I looked at places across the country, such as New York and Milwaukee, that had already created things called community schools which are schools that have a shared use agreement with the surrounding town so that those in the community can use the school's resources after classes are over. I had to decide on how to fund the program, the minimum community hours, and how to staff those hours. And once I was done, I was getting ready to present my policy. So the mock policy I created included a minimum of 25 hours per week allotted for community use time. That would be time after school is uh, not in session and during any non-school events. Um, it had a minimum of two staff members present during those community hours for safety purposes. They would ensure all safety regulations are being met and the facilities are being used properly. I also decided on a 0.15% increase on the income tax to fund the program, which would pay for the additional staffing, their training, and the additional resources needed to keep the schools open longer. And my policy also outlined the available resources um, that would be able to be used by the community, such as the school's gyms, locker rooms, conference rooms, um, their recreational fields, fitness centers, and their libraries. So the results of the proposed policies, the chosen students had the entire school year work on their policies. Our clubs met uh, at very, various points throughout the year during pre-legislative conferences, and we used that time to get feedback on our policies that we had written thus far. Then at the end of the year conference, we usually hold that at the State House, but this year obviously done virtually. We all proposed the policies to our entire state program, and every single policy got passed through after debates and voting. Each policy I heard while all still having the same base concept was executed differently and offered a new perspective on how to tackle the idea, such as funding alternatives and different minimum hour or staff requirements. Sadly, due to COVID, we were unable to complete the last stages of the program and propose one of the policies to actual state legislators, though I hope in the future, once restrictions are eased, we're able to see similar policies be adopted into the Massachusetts general law. The impact of this program, the program actually 
impacted myself and many of my peers quite significantly. As young people, we often want to help change our communities, but either don't know how or where to start or feel as though our voices won't be heard due to our age. However, during the course of the project, it was very clear that many people my age wanted to see this become a reality. You see, social policy changes like this one don't just create active communities, they create connected ones. Neighbors can play pickup games together, friends can meet up at the track and walk around, and people can interact with one another and be active in ways they normally wouldn't be able to. Community schools give people in the town access to exercise equipment, books, showers, and other resources that they may need. There are plenty of social policies that could be that could bring about positive change, but it just takes someone to speak up and bring the idea to the table first. And sometimes that someone is a teenager like myself and the others who spoke before me. In conclusion, and as I wrap up, I just want to touch on why this project was important to me. Pictured on this slide is my high school. It is very new and was built not too long ago and has some amazing recreational facilities that sit dormant and empty after school hours. We have a great walking track, we have multiple fields, and we have a great fitness center. And I would love to see those facilities be put to good use in the community. Um, unfortunately, they're unable to. Now, on a more personal note, this program greatly inspired me individually. While writing my policy, I slowly began to realize how much I loved what I was doing and the fact that I had the ability to impact so many people. This project was actually one of the factors that eventually made me decide to study political science in college in hopes to one day become a lawmaker and create real social policies similar to this one so I can help as many people as possible. In closing, in closing I just want to say that I hope that this project, as well as the projects of my peers, have helped show how valuable youth voices can be in making change in our communities. We are passionate about making the places we live in, play in, and go to school in better for everyone. And we hope that our stories provide some inspiration for others to feel the same way about the communities that we do. That is all I have for today. So thank you all so much for listening to my story about the Active Communities Grant Program. Thank you so much, Jessica. And I just wanna put up this slide here. Um, if you do have questions for our presenters, please remember we have the chat box and um, we can go ahead and take your questions there. And right now we're actually, I'm gonna ask everyone if we can go on camera and that way we can do Q and A that seems a little bit more interactive as well as we can do these days. Great to see everyone. All right, so we have quite a few questions. Um, I'm just gonna start out with a few that I kind of prepared ahead of time. Um, first though, I wanna start out with, uh, in regard to the walk audit tools. Um, that was actually one of our questions from the audience, and I, I know a lot of people have questions about what tools did you use, um, any challenges or lessons learned when you were doing the walk audits. But Naja, when you did your walk audit, you were able to do that obviously with a group of people, um, and I know Jack, you had to do your walk audit virtually. Um, so do do you mind um, just sharing some challenges? of the formats that you used and also what audit tool that you used? Um, absolutely. So um, I won't really say there were really any challenges because what we did was, if you saw in the photos, we had these clipboards. And um, on the clipboards, it was um, like a map of the area that we scoped. And that's kind of what we used for what I called our walkability training when we first um, really sat down and scoped the areas. And then um, what we used was kind of like a measurement system, like we, we rated walkable areas from one to 10. So um, on our check board or our little uh, walkability packet, we um, each location was kind of um, bullet point. So uh, we every time we walked over to that area, we were rated and then we would write down the pros and cons. So that was kind of all the tools that we used. Okay. And the format, um, what format did you, or uh, audit tool did you use? Like, I know there are versions from like Safe Routes to School, AARP. 
Um, we didn't really discuss that, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we may have lost Jack, perhaps. Um, so we're just going to move on to the next question. Um, so David, um, what are your plans for community engagement as you continue your project? I know you're going to be doing some more surveys and reaching out to the community because you made a great point of asking what the community needs instead of deciding for them. So would you like to just share a little bit about your future plans for your project and getting involved with the community engagement? Um, so regarding to that question, I would say I'm probably in the future, I'll probably maybe talk with um, the class president and other officials in my school so that um, they can maybe try to get our high school maybe involved. I'll, I might also um, talk with um, my project leader, Mara Epstein, and maybe he can talk this through even more with um, other, with the town committee and stuff, and maybe even more surveys in the future, just to ask for input from other people. Great idea. Okay, and Jessica, in regard to your project, um, what are some of the pros and cons of the community schools partnership model in light of COVID-19? Well, I think she might be frozen. Of course. So obviously some of the cons would be keeping the places clean and, um, you know, get into the room below or at capacity. Um, and some of the pros would actually be this would bring awareness to healthy, uh, healthy living and wellness by making sure people know that these facilities are up to use and they're able to use them. And also by using the schools outside facilities, such as fields and walking tracks, people will be able to meet in out in the open and not be in so it does offer them you know, another option for physical activity, which is great. So to go to some of the audience questions, um, one of our audience members asked, as a youth that was in a position for this opportunity, how would you reach youth that don't know about this opportunity because they're not tied to their YMCA? So do you wanna share a little bit about maybe how you learned about the YMCA opportunities and what made you feel empowered to get so involved and in, um, start making so much change in your communities? Let's start with, um, we'll start with David. Um, so for the first part, um, it, it was, I have been like, I got involved with the YMCA because like, for the past two years that I have been um, living in Short Hills, um, I have been able to take advantage of the YMCA facilities that um, are offered in the YMCAs. So I do feel like I do feel like I wanted to repay back. And um, the first step maybe would be to start with my own community and start by helping it get sidewalk. Great. Benaja? Um, now, youth and government, you know, it's through the uh, YMCA. So that's kind of how um, I was able to get involved in like um, the Y programs and stuff like that. But for like um, any youth who does want to um, reach out and partake in like, you know, um, these events, I say start with your teachers, like um, club advisors, you have to really reach out. Because, um, you know, I never would have, you know, got to do this opportunity if I weren't in youth and government and I found out about youth and government through um, the civics teacher. So it always starts with school and like um, those who can kind of guide you towards those clubs. Okay. Jessica, do you want to chime in? Yeah, sure. So I also found out uh, about youth and government through my high school. 
And I just got super involved through that. But I think of people who don't really know about youth and government, or maybe their school might not offer one, or they're not near or connected to a YMCA. I think a great place to start is actually attending some of your um, town meetings or school committee meetings if they offer them as an open forum. And just going in and not necessarily, you don't have to speak on it, but listening about what's going on in your community and getting involved and talking with that with your parents, um, teachers, or peers who may be. Um, also wanting to get involved, so you can offer your own insight on what the changes are coming to your community or uh, propose changes that you want to come to your community. It's never too early to get start, started in getting involved within your community and civic engagement. And Jack, we were just asked, um, I was asking an audience question basically, how did you find out about the programming um, through YMCA and um, what made you feel empowered to get so involved? Oh no, we'll catch him when he comes back. <laughs> um, so our next question um, says, wonderful presentation and reflections on community engagement and leadership. How did you engage students with disabilities in this work? For example, truncated domes were described as adequate in one of the presentations. Was this rating given by someone who is blind? So were you able to, um, you know, be pretty inclusive with your the work that you did? Um, if if not, um, is this something that you're considering as you go forward in your work? Um, I think we should definitely be more inclusive about um, those certain accommodations, you know, for people because um, no, the truncated domes weren't examined by someone visual um, by visually impaired people. They were examined by us who you know, are all able-bodied and all, you know, going down those jagged trails. So, you know, we're kind of rating things based off of our perspective. But um, that's also, that's a great point. And I think we um, could also add a lot more inclusivity so we can properly rate those type of things. Does anyone else want to add to that question? Mm, I would say um, I I haven't um, thought about um, including the disabilities disability accommodations. Um, but for now, um, I would like to first focus on um, getting the sidewalks, and then once um, we get the um, bases down, um, we can then start to um, consider how to accommodate for people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So would you agree? Um, maybe is that something to bring back to your to your mentor, and and maybe that can be part of like the planning process, you know, before you officially put them down. Yeah, I'll definitely yeah. think about that and consult yeah. my mentor. Great. And I guess for for Jessica, is that um, how would that question apply? Like for I know that was kind of geared towards walking audits. But are there any issues with um, inclusion, you know, as far as your project with the schools and um, proper accommodations? So I would not foresee something like that um, coming up because oftentimes when schools are being built, they are already being built with disability uh, accommodation in mind, um, always having ramps, elevators, and wheelchair accessible um, ways to get to these facilities. I definitely, if we came across a school that did not have something like that, I would be very much inclined to make sure to make them as accommodating as possible for people of all uh, disabilities and able-bodiedness. Um, but for right now, I don't really see that because we're just kind of reusing the school facilities and opening them up. I don't really foresee that being a challenge for my personal project, but if it did come up, we could easily create um, like a ramp system to get to, uh, say, a walking right okay um next question uh this may be for i don't know i guess this is anyone who wants to answer um our presenters may know or if derek and uh stephanie are still with us what 11 states are included in the active communities grant are the grants still available
And Stephanie and Derek, um, you can just unmute yourself if you want to chime in. Okay, sorry, I was having trouble with the muting, but can everyone hear me? This is yeah. Stephanie. Okay, great. Um, great question about the states. So we've got New York, Massachusetts, um, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, South Carolina, um, Illinois, South Dakota, Nevada, Arkansas, Texas, um, and I'm knowing one more that I'm missing. Um, You're doing them all for memory? That is so impressive. <laughs> yes, I was doing them all for memory. Um, I will figure out what the last one is and get back to um, you and maybe you can share that with the um, with the group, Nicole. Um, in terms of the grants, they are um, specifically, you know, assigned to, or their CDC funded um, YMCA um, to do this work. And so one of the best ways to get involved would be if um, you are in any of those states um, to contact your state alliance of YMCA's or your youth and, local youth and government program. Um, and we are just starting our third year of those grants um, so would love more engagement and involvement. So um, feel free to reach out to those folks and I can include the link to um, those contacts as well, um, Nicole, for, for afterward. Okay. Um, and I did just wanna mention, we have a website with um, some walk audit uh, tools and resources um, that we've um, developed with the Safe Routes Partnership. Um, and so a lot of those are, are typically some of the walk audit tools that we use. Okay, from and I just wanna remind, um, those tuning in after the webinar this is being recorded you will receive an email with the information about how to access the recording page we'll list um, additional resources as well as the recording um, so that way you're able to find out more about the ymca programming and any additional resources that our presenters have and their presentation slides as well so we will just wrap up with one last question, let's pick a great one to close out with. Um, I know, Jack, in your presentation, you were encouraging organizers to you know, reach out to youth, let their voices be heard. Um, so I'd just like to hear real briefly from each of you, um, one tip that you can give um, to organizations, or we actually had a question um, that was specific to public officials and transportation professionals, um, how to better reach young people. So whether it's, you know, communication-wise, uh, social media, going to schools, just give us like one little brief tip um, from each of you, and maybe it's something that impacted you to get involved, um, and then I think we'll close out our questions with that. So uh, we'll start with you, Jack, if that's okay. Sure, uh, can you guys hear me all right? Yeah. Awesome, all right. So I would say personally, the best way to make, um, and I'm gonna kind of focus more on how officials can make themselves accessible to youth. Um, I think the best way to do that is really to increase your presence in youth spaces. Um, and I say that kind of using youth spaces as a phrase that could mean both like the internet and social media or by going into schools. And I think that, you know, each can be as impactful in its own way. Um, and, you know, both can be done very well, both can be done very poorly. You know, you don't want to run a meme account on a, on a Twitter that no one like is, feels engaged with and doesn't take seriously. Um, but you don't want to go give a lecture in a school that doesn't get any engagement because no one feels like it's really connecting to them. So I think by, and by doing this and by being more involved in youth, youth spaces, I think um, leaders, public officials can find and kind of learn more about how to connect with youth voices better. And so I think that, you know, just the more you do it, the same way that any of us say, like the more we do um, advocacy, the better we get at it, the better we learn how to do that sort of stuff, the more that you make a concerted effort to reach out to young people, to include them in your conversations and kind of include them in every decision you're making, the better and um, the better response and better like responses and kind of ideas that you'll receive from young people. Great. I'll go to the next person on my screen, which would be Benaja. Yeah, um, I definitely agree. I think that um, like officials could, like you said, show up to our schools, uh, really engage with us, show us that they're receptive. Cause you know, um, a lot of young change makers, 
may feel that um like we may feel like we're not being heard or you know like um we send an email or we send a letter and it's being tossed into the pile you know so um i just think uh definitely like what jack said they need to make their presence much much more known and um let us know that they they're willing to actively engage with us so uh, we can push for causes that matter to us and jessica you're next on my screen uh just to echo what jack and Banaja had already said um yes make yourself known in our communities make us want to feel comfortable reaching out to you it can be very intimidating as a young person to want to bring about change because i'm afraid that i'm going to be like oh it's just a kid like they don't really know what's going on but we do we are a part of these communities just as much as someone who is uh, of an older age and we want to see change just as much as they do and by taking away the our ability to have a voice it makes us want to be less active in our communities and that just starts a spiral into people growing up and not wanting to be engaged in their community and in civic duty. I always say that the young people of today become the change makers of tomorrow and we need to keep that in mind when we're talking about um, engaging youth within our communities and within government. So just making sure young people feel comfortable and that they will be heard and you want to hear them um by saying here is how you can contact me um is so important and david um yeah i agree with what jack banaja and jessica said about how to increase your influence among the youth and provide a space for them to be heard um i would also like to add that um you should also try to maybe consider um contacting or communicating with uh, more influential members within schools and then they might or with maybe even school officers or student officers and maybe like let the let them inform about um your organizations or individuals so that um the youth would know more about you and can consider and can consider contacting you guys Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, we are going to close out. Let's see. One second. A little technical issue. All right. Can everybody see my slides? Hopefully. Um, so we are just going to close out. Thank you so much to everyone for participating today. Thank you for sharing your projects. Um, David, Jack, Jessica, Banaja, we definitely were inspired by your presentations, um, by your leadership, and I hope that um, there are additional youth that can watch this webinar and you know, also feel inspired to get out in their community. So thank you so much for sharing. Again, we wanna thank our sponsors for making the webinars possible. And if you enjoyed today's discussion, I want to ask that you consider playing a part in keeping more content like this coming your way by making a small donation. Every $5 goes a long way towards expanding and improving our work. And you'll find a donation link in the chat box and it'll be provided in the follow-up email you'll receive with the link to the webinar recording. So I highly um, encourage you to participate um, by donating. And again, thank you again for attending this webinar, Youth Leading the Way, Inspiring Stories of Creating Safe and Accessible Neighborhoods. We do have our next webinar coming up on October 14th. And that webinar is um, with author Lawrence T. Brown. And he has an upcoming book called The Black Butterfly, The Harmful Politics of Race in Space in America. So again, thank you everyone for participating and I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you.